of course, Biden and to some extent Boris Johnson's government blinded themselves to it and were far too optimistic, thought that somehow they could remove this and didn't realize that our support was, although small, was like a small keystone in an arch. And when it was taken away, the whole thing fell down. Tom Tugendhat, who chairs the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, has been pretty withering in his assessment of uh, where this crisis sits in foreign policy disasters that Britain has suffered. How do you characterise it? Oh, I think it's monstrous. It's the biggest betrayal I can think of uh, in British foreign policy since the Second World War. This is uh, just unforgivable. Uh, I mean, and totally extraordinary. I'm extremely angry, of course, with President Biden, um, because in the end, he has followed a policy really of, of Trump's. This is Trump's isolationism. It's a reckless withdrawal. He seems to have put no thought into a proper transition. But I'm also angry with Britain and other NATO partners who could have taken up that slack, taken on that responsibility. There were only 2,500 soldiers in the country at the beginning of this year. That was a, a number that could easily have been taken over by another NATO coalition with some support from the US, but nobody tried to do this thoughtfully. And I think it's also very, very sad for Britain because it suggests we've lost the capacity to really think independently of the US and try to uh, come up with France, with Germany, with Turkey, which decided to stay and other nations a responsible solution. Richard, listening to all of this in Hackney. Richard, how does it seem to you? Welcome. Hello, Eddie. Um, I, I just wonder if the, the solution is to flip the role of the Standards Committee around. I, I notice that every time we, we ask, what about just outlawing second jobs for MPs? People talk about, well, if you're a, a GP or a barrister, you know, you need to, to practice. Well, why don't we make it that the Standards Committee say there are, there are no second jobs, but if there are exceptional circumstances, you can apply to us and we will give you an individual waiver. And that just seems a much easier way of doing everything. But this, the original Owen Patterson problem wasn't about a, a second job per se, was it? It was about lobbying, paid lobbying. Well, well, that's the other thing as well. That, that has to stop because if, if you're being paid two or three hundred thousand pounds as a lobbyist and you're getting 80,000 pounds as an MP, then it's being an MP, which is the second job. You're, you're, you're not an MP who's a lobbyist. You're a lobbyist who happens to hold a seat in a constituency. What's your view of... How has this coloured your view of the Westminster Parliament? Um, it just reminds me of the, the, the days of... The last days of the major government, where it was... It, it, it's not... It is one rule. It's not one rule for them and one rule for us. They, they seem to have no rules. They just seem to do whatever they want to do. And there are no consequences. There are never any consequences for any of these actions. And it's it's disappointing. I mean, my God, I, I can't imagine why I would encourage my kids to get involved in politics. Um, I, I think it's just self-serving. Uh, David's in Paddington. David, what do you think? Well, uh, Eddie, I come on to LBC every day at four o'clock listening and hoping that I'm going to hear a good mix of uh, evaluated proper journalism. This is coming from unnamed sources. Surely one of the rules of journalism is to check your source, find out who it is and double check it. But to have an hour on LBC about gossip from six months ago, from October last year, when he said, somebody's saying that somebody said something to someone and someone said something. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. It's childish. It's not good journalism. And I'm thoroughly disappointed in you for following this story until you get your source. Once you've got your source, come back and let's have a proper discussion. You're inclined to they... believe Boris Johnson with his record of lying than three people who say they heard it. Listen, he's got a thoroughly good record of lying, as you say, like the side of the bus and Brexit. But there's no proof of this. It's six months old. It's coming right on the back of this last thing about Dyson and who texted what to whom. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, clearly a media campaign to get, get, to get Boris out. David, David you, what makes you think it's a media campaign? A what makes you think a it's a media texting? campaign? Because, come on, last week there was this thing about a text about Dyson, mm -hmm. and now this from unnamed sources from right. October. Why would it, why is it suddenly coming out now, Eddie, at, at six months later from an unnamed source? And you don't, think, you don't think Dyson and this and the furnishing of the flat 
and Jennifer R. Curie and others. You don't think all of that adds up to something to you? It's all a media get-up. Well, wait, come on, where's the source? Where's the name source from six months ago? When you've got the source, come back and I'll... Yeah, the source is, three source sources have spoken to journalists unnamed, independently. Unnamed, unnamed. Ah, unnamed that's the most unchecked. critical thing, is it? No, no, when you yes, say... Un- hold on, hold on, David. No, no, don't, don't say unchecked. The name, it's David, gossip, don't say unchecked. Gossip, gossip, they're gossip. unnamed, but they're not unchecked. That's why independent journalists have spoken to the sources independently and individually. And by the way... Yeah. By the way, yeah. some of the politicians we've heard speaking on the record today also make good use of being unnamed sources to journalists. So let's, yeah, not, be know, that. let's not be naive okay. about that. Let's not be naive about that. OK, but look, 2,000 2, people a day are dying in India. There's 24 million and we devoted hours of the, And we devoted hours to you India know. last week, and we're going to talk yes. about it again in the next hour. But don't, you think but, the, the, is... but don't you think the Prime Minister's probity and integrity is important to talk about? It is once you've got the sources checked and double checked. The just sources as you would have, have been checked, and we'll to speak BBC. to Robert Peston in a moment. Yeah, from ITV, another another gutter newspaper oh, as, as, as far as it goes. It's it's just gutter gossip for, for, of tittle tattle of who said what to whom. It from last it's, October. It's called six journalism. Months old, six months old, and maybe. that's the Come critical on, fact for you, October. is it? Because it didn't happen yesterday. No, it happened six months ago, and there's no evidence to back it up. It's just there's, gossip. There, is, there are accounts from at least three different people that it was said. Now, it is disputed. We had Michael Gove and his words, and Boris Johnson was asked about it again today and said, no, he didn't say it. But when, yes, uh, so when well, anything well, between 125,000 and 150,000 people are dead... The, to have three people inside Downing Street, by the way, this is not pass us by. This is they didn't overhear this in, in a market or in a, in a public loo. They're in the heart of Downing Street, and they say that Boris Johnson said, "No more effing lockdowns. Let the bodies pile up in their thousands." You immediately go to giant media conspiracy. No, I don't say it's a giant media conspiracy. All I'm saying is highly suspicious that there's no source. It's six months that's old. That's how it works. You know that's to, how it works. We've established thinking, that. Why are we spending an hour talking about it? OK, give us five minutes on it because it's involving the Prime Minister. And he says he didn't say it. Somebody else says he did. He didn't, he did. He didn't, he did. But they, the no, hour, no, no it's, it, it's, not one, it's not one person's word against another. It, well, there are three no, sources. Well, okay. Three unnamed, unnamed sources. What isn't surely, Eddie? Did you not learn that you're supposed to check your source in journalism? The sources have have been checked. You're confusing checking sources with naming them. And that's a fatal mistake, David. Last night, Boris Johnson did not take part in the sleaze debate in the House of Commons. Downing Street said he was on a hospital visit in Northumberland and would not get back in time on the train. Uh, Critics pointed out he rushed back to London on a private jet last week to attend a function for a friend in a male-only private members club. But leaving that to one side, uh, as for yesterday, not being able to get back on time, the Mail Online tonight claims an exclusive with a photograph of Boris Johnson last night, apparently at King's Cross Railway Station in London at 4.41. The debate in the Commons went on till just after seven, suggesting he could have attended if he'd wanted. Is it possible that sometimes Boris Johnson would rather disappear than face difficult moments? In 2015, he promised protesters opposed to a third runway at Heathrow Airport that he would lie down with you in front of those bulldozers and stop the building, stop the construction of the third runway. But when he had a chance to vote in the Commons three years later, he suddenly went to Afghanistan. As you can hear in this clip from 2018, Greg Hans is speaking, having resigned from the government over Heathrow, and other MPs are shouting, where's Boris? So this is not just for me, a debate about Heathrow, important though that is. It's also a debate about being true to your word and to your election pledges. In 2019, during the general election campaign, Boris Johnson was unwilling to do some interviews, including with Piers Morgan on ITV. So they tracked him down live on telly, but he disappeared into a fridge. Mr Johnson, while you have five minutes, you're live on Good Morning. Why did, why did, could you talk to Piers and Susanna for me? I'll be, I'll be with you in a second. I'll be with you in a second. Yeah, Thank I have an earpiece here in my hands, ready to go. <laughs> right, he's been taken inside, into the freezer. He's gone into the fridge. So he disappeared to Afghanistan rather than vote on Heathrow and he disappeared into a fridge rather than be interviewed on ITV. People, people are beginning to wonder whether Boris Johnson sometimes likes to disappear. It was an absolute word salad from the Prime Minister. You know, 
first of all, he says again, if not now, when? And then almost in the very same breath, he says that 35% of 18 to 30-year-olds are not vaccinated, answering his own question. He says that he's very worried about the dangers of nightclubs opening less than 24 hours after he opened nightclubs. I mean, it's it's a joke. He's just... He's just collapsing under the weight of his own contradictions at the one time when the country and vulnerable people in this country need leadership and clarity and consistency of messaging. Right now, hospitals are overwhelmed. Last week, we had major hospitals cancelling serious life and death cancer operations and even liver transplants because their ICUs were too filled with COVID patients. There were no ICU beds to go ahead with those surgeries. Boris Johnson may feel absolutely fine about that, sitting in his armchair in checkers, but frontline staff like me have to look at those patients. We have to look at them in the eye. And what do we say to them? You can't have your surgery because Boris Johnson decided to let rip and use the soundbite of Freedom Day. It's it's appalling. On nightclubs, uh, if it is the right policy to insist on double vaccinations for people from the end of September, I'm not saying it is, but if it is, then what is the sense in allowing nightclubs after all of these months where they've been closed? I've no desire for them to be shut any longer than necessary. I understand the pressure they're under. But if the right policy is the policy at the end of September, then why allow them to open now with all the obvious inherent dangers that we've seen even from the near continent? There is absolutely no justification for that. My children could answer that question. How the Prime Minister cannot understand how ludicrous it is for him to say, I'm worried about this, but I'm going to wait 10 weeks until I instigate this new measure. I do not know. From the very first moment this pandemic began, there has been one consistent message. You act decisively, you act fast. And the human cost of prevaricating and dithering, as he has done the whole way through, is tens of thousands of avoidable deaths. And he's done it again today. It just, it it honestly breaks my heart. Tell you what I made of a key part of it. Um, I'm interested in accountability. Uh, I don't have a personal interest in whether Matt Hancock is a liar or Dominic Cummings is a liar. I have a professional interest in accountability. That's part of my job. Now, we were talking with Ben Kentish earlier, our Westminster correspondent, uh, because I was curious as to why journalists are still not allowed in the room. Because if you're in the room, you can ask a follow-up question. You can pursue a minister and try to get to the truth. If you're on a remote line with someone muting you, you can ask one question and then you're shut up. Now, Ben very kindly asked uh, the uh, Prime Minister's official spokesman today and was told it's not feasible at the moment, given the numbers we can have and the numbers required to run the press conference itself. Um, I understand the room is big enough to hold six journalists socially distanced, but there we are. The official line is it's not possible. Now, there's a direct line between journalists not being in the room and the spectacle that we all just sat through. At around 5.15, Matt Hancock volunteered this. He wants to answer as many questions as we can, as fully as we can. Those were his words. What he went on to do was to not offer any journalist a single follow-up question. He could easily say, Laura, uh, do you have a follow-up? Laura, is there anything else you want to ask? Beth? I've given you my answer. Do you want to ask another question? Not once. And in fact, when journalists did ask follow-up questions because they they beat the mute button, it's like a game show, except it's deadly serious. People are dying. When they did ask a follow-up question, when Beth Rigby managed to, to get through the wire, get past the guards, his face was thunderous. Now, this isn't any day in this COVID crisis. We've just heard from a man who was at the heart of Downing Street, Dominic Cummings, who said that Matt Hancock lied about people receiving treatment. He lied about PPE. He said people. He, he said that, he, that Matt Hancock told Boris Johnson in the cabinet room that people would be tested before being sent into care homes, but they were not. He said Matt Hancock was too focused on hitting his targets. And when Matt Hancock was asked in detail the forensic detail about those matters which affect 
thousands of lives and, it is alleged, killed thousands of people unnecessarily. He waffled on and would not hold himself up to journalistic inquiry. People were muted. No one was invited for a follow-up question. Despite him saying, I want to answer as many questions as we can, as fully as we can. He said, there will be a time. It will be a time for this. You would have thought the time would be when he's on national radio and television in the £2.6 million Downing Street briefing room when journalists are asking him direct questions. You would have thought that might be the time that he would come forward with answers, direct answers to detailed, direct questions. But there were none. That's my view. What about yours? Well, uh, we've first uh, exported to Europe for quite some time, and obviously I actually voted for Brexit because I thought it would be uh, in our long-term uh, interest. But I have to say, they're changing the rules almost on a daily basis. Just today, DHL sent us some new regulations and requirements for the paperwork, which are different to what they sent us last week and probably different to what they sent us a few weeks before that. And everybody seems to have a different set of rules, so it is quite confusing and it is quite time-consuming. And no sign of it settling down if the rules are changing even this week? No, as I say, we're having some diff- We actually export to America. We're finding it easier to ship goods to America and Australia than we are to uh, to Germany and France, which is, you know, would seem to be quite ridiculous, to be honest. What are your customers saying? Um, well, when we've got domestic clients, which obviously are purchasing from us directly, it's a bit of a problem because they're trying to find out their EURI number, which is like the VAT number, which of course you don't have as an individual. Uh, our our domestic, sorry, our international in- uh, distributors, I find it less of an issue because they're sort of more au fait with importation and, and, and duty. But it is still providing us with some challenges because, as I say, the regulations and the paperwork seem to be varying on a, on a daily basis almost. At this stage, what would help you? I think just clarity. Honestly, I really think there's a set of clear uh, instructions that came down from on high that said this is what you have to fill in because... We're finding different regulations as well for different parts of the EU, which seems to be, uh, you know, complete nonsense, really. Why, if they're one, one entity, one organisation, why have to have different paperwork for, say, Germany or France? It doesn't make any, any sense. And, and when you say on high, Martin, where do you think that is? Um, I, well, I think probably at, at um, a government level, really. I mean, it's almost, it almost feels like, and I, and I probably would say, would say this, it almost feels like they're being spiteful. They're making the rules of us to go along. Well, the EU. Yeah, and the incident with the ham sandwich and the, the truck driver seems to have sort of crystallised that uh, that sentiment amongst many people like myself who are exported to Europe. We seem to feel as though the regulations are being changed on a almost on a weekly basis, almost to spite us, which I think is going to harm everybody in the long run because. We bring stuff in as well from, from, from overseas. We don't seem to have any problems bringing it in. So it doesn't feel like we are uh, changing the rules. It seems very straightforward bringing stuff in through Europe into UK, but exporting to Europe seems to be uh, problematic for a product like ours. And thinking of the long term, and you voted for Brexit because you, you thought there would be a long term benefit, do you think yeah. that can still come for your business? I believe so, yeah. We had our best year last year, funnily enough, in 2020, despite, despite COVID. Um, and we are seeing growth this year as well, but it, it's, it's mainly domestic and it's mainly to America and Australia, more so than Europe, which you know is a, is a bit is a source of frustration to us. I also wonder too uh, what you made of uh, what happened at that Downing Street briefing when questions were asked about uh, government ministers uh, breaking the rules. Uh, three times Matt Hancock was asked, and uh, three times he essentially said, "No, I'm not talking about that." Now, there are a couple of things here, aren't there? In response to the first question from Laura Kunzberg, which was essentially this, if a government minister is found to have broken the rules, should they resign? Uh, Matt Hancock's response was, well, look, uh, Boris Johnson answered lots of questions in the Commons today about this, so I'm not going to add to that. Well, to be strictly accurate, Boris Johnson responded to lots of questions in the Commons. Uh, But on some of the critical questions, there was no answer. The other thing Matt Hancock wanted to emphasise was that this was a COVID briefing. It should all be about COVID. There's lots to say about COVID because, if I can remember the phrase um, that uh, Matt Hancock used, some incredibly important things were going on. And that's a fair point, of course, isn't it? 
because it is a COVID briefing. And I suppose you could argue, look, what on earth are journalists asking other things for? And why would a politician standing at the podium want to talk about something other than COVID if it's a COVID briefing? Well, that doesn't hold water either, does it? Because was it last week that Boris Johnson himself at a supposedly COVID briefing, was asked lots of questions about the European Super League, you remember. He didn't respond to those by saying, oh, no, 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 this is a COVID briefing. I can't possibly talk about football. He enthusiastically talked about football at great length at a supposed COVID briefing. So why was it okay to talk about non-COVID things last week when the Prime Minister uh, was passionate about trying to stop the European Super League. But when questions come up about government ministers' probity, that's not allowed today. It's also worth saying that at a previous news conference, uh, Boris Johnson himself d- decided uh, to launch a, a political attack on, on some of his opponents. Again, nothing to do with COVID, but that was OK then. But tonight, questions were not answered about government ministers and their behaviour. You may have your own view on this and feel free to share it in the usual way. The other thing I would say before we get into the Electoral Commission is this. Uh, You know, we can talk about should journalists have asked those questions. Uh, We can talk about should the news conference always be about COVID. Um, I I stress it it, it frequently uh, is uh, always talking about things that are non-COVID. But the other thing is that this... This room in which the news conference took place cost £2.6 million of your money. This is supposed to be a media briefing room. And uh, today, we had a minister standing up and repeatedly saying, I'm not answering that. I'm not even going to try to answer that question. So what is the point of spending £2.6 million when ministers seem to feel they can simply ignore questions. And let's keep in mind that the journalists anyway have their microphones muted after the first question is asked. Tell you what I made of a key part of it. Um, I'm interested in accountability. Uh, I don't have a personal interest in whether Matt Hancock is a liar or Dominic Cummings is a liar. I have a professional interest in accountability. That's part of my job. Now, we were talking with Ben Kentish earlier, our Westminster correspondent, uh, because I was curious as to why journalists are still not allowed in the room. Because if you're in the room, you can ask a follow-up question. You can pursue a minister and try to get to the truth. If you're on a remote line with someone muting you, you can ask one question and then you're shut up. Now, Ben very kindly asked uh, the uh, Prime Minister's official spokesman today and was told it's not feasible at the moment, given the numbers we can have and the numbers required to run the press conference itself. Um, I'm, I understand the room is big enough to hold six journalists socially distanced, but there we are. The official line is it's not possible. Now, there's a direct line between journalists not being in the room and the spectacle that we all just sat through. At around 515 Matt Hancock volunteered this. He wants to answer as many questions as we can, as fully as we can. Those were his words. What he went on to do was to not offer any journalist a single follow-up question. He could easily say, Laura, uh, do you have a follow-up? Laura, is there anything else you want to ask? Beth, I've given you my answer. Do you want to ask another question? Not once. And in fact, when journalists did ask follow-up questions because they, they beat the mute button, it's like a game show, except it's deadly serious. People are dying. When they did ask a follow-up question, when Beth Rigby managed to, to get through the wire, get past the guards, his face was thunderous. Now, this isn't any day in this COVID crisis. We've just heard from a man who was at the heart of Downing Street, Dominic Cummings, who said that Matt Hancock lied about people receiving treatment. He lied about PPE. He said people. We, he, he said that he that Matt Hancock told. Boris Johnson in the cabinet room that people would be tested before being sent into care homes, but they were not. He said Matt Hancock was too focused on hitting his targets. And when Matt Hancock was asked in detail 
the forensic detail about those matters which affect thousands of lives and, it is alleged, killed thousands of people unnecessarily. He waffled on and would not hold himself up to journalistic inquiry. People were muted. No one was invited for a follow-up question. Despite him saying, I want to answer as many questions as we can, as fully as we can. He said, there will be a time it will be a time for this. You would have thought the time would be when he's on national radio and television in the £2.6 million Downing Street briefing room when journalists are asking him direct questions. You would have thought that might be the time that he would come forward with answers, direct answers to detailed, direct questions. But there were none. That's my view. What about yours? thinking about the roadmap is that I think just a few extra things could make it so much more effective. And one of those things is kind of avoiding what the Running Me Trust kind of yesterday highlighted as a risk that COVID becomes a disease of the poor. Um, And we can stop that happening. Uh, Because kind of what, you know, like um, there was some sage notes that were leaked um, to The Guardian last week, where the SAGE committee kind of called COVID kind of a perfect storm for deprived communities. People are much more exposed as they, you know, they have to go out and work and often they work in reasonably unsafe workspaces. um, And they're more likely to get sick once they get COVID. And they're less able to isolate, partly because of bad housing and partly because they literally can't afford to. All of those things together have meant that throughout the pandemic, we have seen um, higher case rates and higher deaths in more deprived communities. It's, it's very kind of stark difference if you look at it. And that includes um, minority ethnic communities. And we're already seeing, again, that the same kind of areas that were highest throughout last summer, who have been in lockdown almost all the time last summer in some form or other, are again in the top 10. Because they're just communities where it's very, very difficult to lock down. Lockdown works really well for richer people who can work at home. Basically, you said it needn't be uh, a disease of the poor and it can be stopped. How? By supporting those communities, by investing in them. So, what they, so the, very, the very first thing you should do is just pay people a living wage to isolate. And, you know, like Sage has repeatedly highlighted, Dido Harding herself, who runs Test and Trace, said that one of the biggest issues with self isolation is people literally cannot afford to stay home. At the moment, £500 for two weeks is much below the minimum wage and a lot of people aren't getting it even you know you have to you have to kind of show that you you know you're entitled to some kind of government support to get that payment so that would be a really big fix and that wouldn't just allow people to self-isolate it would encourage people to get tested so there's also been evidence that people who are on lower incomes are much less likely to get tested because they're not in a position to isolate and when you have you know, both financial and legal penalties for not isolating with a positive test. Why would you come forward for testing if you can't do anything about it? So we're seeing much less uptake of testing in those kind of communities and people are less likely to give their contacts. So fixing that would be a massive boon to actually preventing more illness and um, and people going out and affecting other people. 